New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as New Post-War Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. tried to take this curve too fast, and when the car turned over and caught fire, he was trapped inside. I'm afraid it isn't that simple, Sheriff. But, Nick, it looks perfectly obvious. It is if you look at the right thing. But turn your flashlight inside the car. Maybe there. Plus, plus well, 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 see what I mean? And now, the case of the man who died twice. Today's Hello? adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. <laughs> A case which called Nick and Patsy to southern Florida has given them the chance to combine business with a winter vacation. But the case is finished, and tomorrow they have to return to New York. It's late at night now, as they drive along in a rented car, enjoying a warm, tropical evening. Oh, Nick, I'm going to hate you, Glory. <laughs> you sure it isn't young Sheriff Graham, the lady? Oh, Nick. <laughs> Just because you went swimming a couple of times and dancing once or twice, you... Listen. Siren. You haven't been speeding, have you, Nick? No. Better pull over to the side of the road anyway. Well, it isn't the police, it's the fire engine. The police are right behind. That was Sheriff's car. Oh, Nick, let's follow them. I always did love to chase fire engines. Okay, I'd like to find out what the excitement is myself. Here we go, Patsy. destroyed in the fire. Well, you can find out who he was in the license plate, can't you, Dave? Easier than that, Patsy. This is one of Mike Talbot's drive it yourself rentals from Bay City. He'll have a record of who took it out. Mm. Maybe he was a tourist. I guess so. The way I figured it, he tried to take this curve too fast and went off the road. Uh-huh. And when the car turned over and caught fire, he was trapped inside. I'm afraid it isn't that simple, Sheriff. What do you mean, Nick? If he skidded off the road, there'd be tire marks on the pavement. I looked. There aren't any. Well, maybe with all the other cars that stopped to watch the fire... That isn't all, Patsy. What? Look inside the car, Sheriff. Huh? Throw your flashlight on the gear shift. What? Why, it's in low. You only use low gear when you first start out. Exactly what I mean. This wasn't any accident, Sheriff. Looks as if you have a murder case on your hands. Bill, three more cups of coffee. Yeah, coming up, Joe. Well, we better skip the coffee, Dave. It's late. We have to catch that early plane back for New York. But Nick, uh, I want to talk to you about that. This thing tonight's got me worried. Oh, you'll handle it all right, Dave. I'm not so sure. Being good sheriff and being good detective are two different things. If I fall down on this case... Um, and here's the coffee, Sheriff. Oh, thanks, Bill. Uh, sheriff, I hear Sam Ritter's out to get his old job back. Uh, that's what I hear. <laughs> You're sorry, Dave, for Bay County, and that old crude ever gets back in office again. Hey, Bill, where's the hamburger? Huh? I'll uh, be right with you, Toby. Uh, who's Sam Ritter, Dave? He used to be the sheriff for me. Oh. Stole the taxpayers blind, but he's mighty good at handing out the old salve, and lots of folks like him. Well, they must like you better, or they wouldn't have elected you. Oh, you know how it is. I was just out of the Army, had a few medals and a few citations, and... 
I guess that's why folks voted for me. It'll be different next time. The war is ancient history now. And you think if you don't solve this murder, where it'll be sheriff again? Something like that. It'd be all he'd need. Oh. He's already talking it around, but I'm too young and inexperienced. Well, maybe I am, but by golly, at least I'm on it. That counts for a lot. Nick, couldn't we... Now, wait a minute, Patsy. I know what you're going to say. Nick, it'd mean a lot to me if you could stick around a couple of days and help. Why don't you, Nick? You can spare that much time. <laughs> okay. What chance do I have with a both of you? You mean you will, Nick? Sure. Oh, good. I always like to be sure a killer is caught. Well... Now we get some action. Right. Tell you what you do, Dave. You find out from the drive at yourself place who hired that car. Then have an autopsy performed to see whether you can discover the real cause of this. I'll get on it right away. And I'll cancel our plane reservation. That's great, Nick. Thanks a lot. I'll be around at your hotel bright and early tomorrow morning. Oh, no, no, you won't. Huh? It's early tomorrow morning right now. And if you show up before 9 o'clock, I'll start committing murders myself. With you as the first victim. <laughs> What's the idea? It can't be 9 o'clock yet. It's still dark outside. I know, but I wanted to tell you what I found out. That guy was poisoned with cyanide. How do you know? I got the doc out of bed and made him perform the autopsy right away. I see. You know who the man was yet? Yeah, sure. His name was George Brennan. He was staying at the Bayview Hotel. Anyway, that's what he told Mike Calvert when he rented the car. I hired it by the week. Did you get Mike out of bed, too? Sure. Why? Because here's one person you're not getting out of bed. See you at nine at the Bayview Hotel. Here's Mr. Brennan's cottage, sir. Yes. Look at the coffee table over there. Two highball glasses. Uh-huh. Brennan evidently had a visitor before he went out last night. You know who that could have been, Joey? I couldn't say, Sheriff. That's why Mr. Brennan took one of the cottages instead of the suite in the main building. Said he wanted privacy. We'll find out whether anybody asked at the desk for him. Uh, no, they didn't, sir. I was on duty last night, and if there had been anybody, the clerk would have sent me to show him the way. Well, perhaps whoever it was phoned, and Brennan told him the number of the cottage. Yes, ma'am, that could have been it. Okay, Joey, thanks. We'll let you know him we're through. Oh, and uh, here's something for your trouble. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Let's see if there's anything in that bag while I take a look at the closet over here. Okay. Mmm, alligator hide. He had plenty of money to spend on luggage. It's brand new, too. Oh, all the labels have been taken out of the suit. Yeah? That's funny. Had some reason for wanting to conceal his identity. Uh-oh. Oh, you find something, Patsy? I'll say I did. Hidden under the lining of his suitcase. Photograph of a girl. Yeah, good looking, too. Well, from the hat she's wearing, I say this was taken about 10 or 12 years ago. What's that uh, writing on it? To Griffin, with all my love, Linda. Griffin? <laughs> That's an odd first name. I never heard it before. Hey, wait a minute. Look at this. It's just a book of matches, isn't it? Yeah, I found it under the coffee table. Hmm. They're full of matches, but they've all been burned. That's not what I'm talking about. Oh, yes. Just look at those little indentations around the edge of the matchbook. Yes, I see. Probably made by a fingernail. Hmm. They look too neat and regular for that. Some people do that sort of thing unconsciously. Nervous habits, you know. Hmm. They're usually very careful to keep the pattern regular. It's the advertising on the cover I'm talking about. Look. Littlefield Construction Company, Mordenville, Ohio. Keep on reading. T.J. Littlefield, President. Griffin, Bu Griffin Buckley, Executive Vice President. Griffin Buckley? You see, it's the same name as the one on that picture. And I'll bet there are many people in the world with Griffin for first name. Betty, he's right, Nick. If George Brennan and Griffin Buckley were the same person, it would be only natural for him to carry matches advertising the company he worked for. And that'd explain how these matches got from Ohio down here to Florida. Uh -huh. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, you're jumping to conclusions. Matches like these get sent all over the country. But there is one thing. What? The initials are the same. 
G.B. George Brennan, Griffin Buckley. People have a tendency to keep the same initials even when they change their names. Now, let me see that picture again. And here you are, Nick. What town did you say those matches came from? Uh, Mortonville, Ohio. Uh-huh. Look at the photographer's mark on the back of this picture. The Ace Portrait Studios, Mortonville, Ohio. Sheriff, you've hit on something. Well, if this guy was Griffin Buckley, how are you going to find out for sure? The easiest thing in the world. Patsy? Put through a long-distance call to the Littlefield Construction Company, Mortonville, Ohio. Yes, this is Littlefield. My name's Nick Carter, Mr. Littlefield. I'm calling you about Mr. Griffin Buckley. What about him? Is he about 40 years old, 5 feet 8, dark hair and eyes, weight around 175? Yes, but... Is he in Mortonville now? Of course he's not. Then I'm afraid I have some bad news. I hope I'm wrong, but I think Mr. Buckley has met with an accident. Is this some kind of a joke? I know he met with an accident. You do? This car went over an embankment and burst into flames with him inside it. But, but how could you know? It only happened last night a few miles out of Bay City, Florida. What are you talking about? That accident happened right here in Mortonville the week before last. No, she didn't know. Rip was buried ten days ago. Nick Carter hangs up the phone, a puzzled expression on his face. The same man seems to have been killed exactly the same way in two different places. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Back to the case of a man who died twice. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Nick decided the body found in a wrecked and blazing car along the Florida Highway is that of Griffin Buckley of Mortonville, Ohio. But on phoning Mortonville, Nick is told that Buckley died there ten days ago, trapped inside a burning car. Nick and Patsy are now in Mortonville, talking to Buckley's employer, T.J. Littlefield. But Carter, Griff couldn't have been killed in Florida two nights ago. He's been buried right here in Mortonville for ten days. Did you see the body? Well, no. It's pretty badly burned. But it was in Griff's car. The clothes were Griff, the watch and ring. And besides, Mrs. Buckley herself made the identification of the body. Is Mrs. Buckley's name Linda? No, it's mine. Oh. Oh, You're probably thinking of Linda Harris. Griff was engaged to her a long time ago. Where is she now? She died shortly before they were to have been married. I don't think Griff ever got over it. I know he did. Her picture was the only thing he took with him from here. Except for clothes, of course. That is, if we're right in thinking that body in Florida is Griffin Buckley. So we must have had a reason for hiding out under an assumed name. That reason may have something to do with the death of that man who's buried here. If you're suggesting anything dishonest or criminal, I don't believe it. Not Griff Buckley. No, it's... Some kind of strange coincidence. Entirely too strange to be a coincidence. But that was no accident in Florida, Mr. Littlefield. It was murder. Griff murdered? Poisoned with cyanide. The car was set on fire in an attempt to cover up. But that's fantastic. No one had any reason to kill Griff. How about insurance? Well, he did carry a large policy. $50,000, I believe. Payable to whom? His wife, I understand. Hmm. Perhaps I better talk to her. Can you give me your address? Well, yes, yes, of course. I'll write it down for you. I have a pen here in my desk drawer. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, I shut the door on my thumb like a nip. Oh, that's a shame. Pinched it pretty badly, too. Oh, uh, instead of our going alone, suppose you take us to her. That is, if you could spare the time. Well, I'd be glad to. But surely you can't think that either Griff or Mrs. Buckley would... It's too soon for me to think anything about this case, Mr. Littlefield, but the fact remains that she stood to collect $50,000 on her husband's debt, and murder has been committed for a lot less. You're crazy. I don't know who the man in Florida was, but my husband is buried right here in Woodlawn Cemetery. It is rather personal, Mrs. Buckley, but were you and your husband happy together? Happy? I hated him. Myra. And he hated me. 
of my room. Griff's never loved anybody in his life oh, but that Paris girl. Years. Perhaps you and Griff weren't ideally happy, Myra, but now that he's dead... As far as I'm concerned, it makes no difference whether he's dead or alive. Mr. Buckley, I'm going to ask the court to open his grave. Why? Because I think the auto accident was a fake. And if I'm right, you may find yourself facing a murder charge. Me? What are you talking about? You're the only person who profited by your husband's death. And that $50,000 insurance policy is a motive any jury would take notice of. So that's it. You're going to try to pin it on me, are you? Well, you can't. It was Griff. He killed him. He killed whom? That man in the car. The man who was buried here under the name of Griffin Buckley. Mara, what are you saying? So it wasn't your husband. All right, it wasn't. Then who was it? I don't know, and I don't care. Mara, why did you say it was Griff? As soon as I saw the body, I realized that Griff was probably keen to get away from me. And if that's what he wanted, why should I stop him? Especially if I stood to make $50,000. But Myra... Did you think I was going to say, no, that's not my husband. It's someone my husband murdered. I'm the wife of a thief and a murderer. I'm not that big a fool. What do you mean? wife of a thief. Griff had been stealing from the company for years. From my company? Of course. You mean to say that your husband killed some unknown person, put him in a car and set fire to it in order to cover up his theft from the Littlefield Company? That's the only thing it could be. If everyone thought Griff was dead, he'd be safe. You had your books examined since Buckley's disappearance, Mr. Littlefield? Well, no, but... Would you tell anything if we went down and looked them over now? Well, it would take several days to make a complete checkup. But we might discover something from the bank statement which came in this morning. I'll bet you'll find that your trusted little grip took everything that wasn't nailed down. Let's go, Mr. Littlefield. And Mrs. Buckley, you better not try to leave town. Don't worry. If Griff was killed in Florida, it's just as good as if he'd been killed here. That insurance hasn't been paid yet. And I'm staying right here until I collect every cent of it. <laughs> How about it? Find anything out of the way, Mr. Littlefield? Yes. This check for 23000 I didn't authorize that. Any others? Here's one for 19600 Another for 40000 mm, It begins to look as though Mrs. Buckley knew what she was talking about. And here's another one. I never should have given him the power to sign checks. He must have gotten away with at least 100000 of the stockholders' money in the last month alone. That's a pretty big loss for a business this size, isn't it, Mr. Littlefield? Oh, there won't be any loss to us. The bonding company will have to make good. Oh. But it's the fact that Griff would do a thing like this that... I just can't understand it. Mr. Littlefield, could you make a trip to Bay City, Florida with me? Well, of course, but why? I want to make sure the man there is really Buckley. And you can identify him. Very well. Shall I get plane reservations? Uh, that won't be necessary. We can go in my plane. Oh, you fly? It's been a hobby of mine for years. I'll phone the airport to get the plane ready, and if you're not afraid of night flying, we can be there by midnight. Good. The sooner the better. <laughs> Dinner, Mr. Littlefield. I'll say it was. You know, Carter, I've been wondering if we couldn't stay over here in Atlanta tonight. I'm more tired than I realize. It's been a terrible day for me. Well, I'll take over the controls if you want me to. Oh, do you fly? Nick's a wonderful pilot, Mr. Littlefield. Have my license with me if you're not afraid to take a chance. No, go right ahead. I'll move into the back seat and relax. Beautifully, Mr. Littlefield. Yeah, you actually don't need a hand on the controls at all for straight flying. Oh. What's the matter? I'm trying to find a match, and I caught this sore thumb in my pocket. Uh, cigarette? No, thanks. I uh, guess I don't have any matches. Miss Bowen, would you get me a pack from the map compartment up there? Well, of course. I uh, have some paper matches in there. Oh. With your own advertising on them. Those matchbooks were Griff's idea. One of the last things he did was order 100,000 of them. The day the shipment arrived, I'd just come from the funeral. You mean the matches weren't delivered until after Buckley disappeared? Yes. I get all choked up at the sight of them. And to think that all the yes. time... Look at the edge of this matchbook. 
You have a nervous habit of indenting the edge of a book of paper matches with your fingernails, don't you, Mr. Littlefield? Why, yes, why? How'd you get that sore thumb? I pinched it in my desk drawer. You saw me do it. Oh, no, I didn't. I saw you go through the motion. But that's not a bruise. That's a burn. You sure you didn't burn it when a book of matches went off in your hands? Of course I'm sure. Those matchbooks weren't delivered until after Buckley left Mortonville. Yet one of them was found in his room in Bay City. A matchbook with the edge indented just like this one. With all the matches still in the book, but burned. I see. That was very careless of me, wasn't it, Carter? So you did kill Buckley? Yes. And I'm rather proud of the way I worked when I discovered that Griff had been robbing the company, I gave him the choice of going to the penitentiary or helping me make a real cleanup. Huh. Some choice. And your scheme was that he should take all the cash on hand and presumably be killed in a wreck so that the police wouldn't even look for him. Right. The bonding company would repay the loss. Griff could go to South America, so he thought, and we'd each be richer by a very neat sum. Uh, who was the man who was buried in Mortonville? I haven't the least idea. Just a hitchhiker who answered just general description. What? I picked him up, offered him a drink of liquor. Flavored with cyanide. That's right. Oh. Then I phoned Griff that everything was ready. So he met me outside of town with his car, changed clothes with the dead hitchhiker. <laughs> the rest was easy. But when you killed Buckley, why did you do it exactly the same way? Why not? It was a method I tried, and it worked perfectly. So I flew down here Friday night when I was supposed to be spending the weekend in Chicago and took care of it. <laughs> Who would connect an auto wreck in Florida with one in Ohio? Nick did. The little field, as soon as we land, I'm going to have to... As turn... soon as I land, Jimmy. I'm afraid you and Miss Bowen are getting out now. You forget I'm at the controls. And you forget that this plane will keep itself level even with a dead man at the controls. This is a revolver at the back of your neck, Carter, so keep your hands on that wheel. Yes. And no tricks from you, Miss Bowen. I uh, think we're over a rather large swamp now, and I doubt that your bodies will ever be found after I drop you out of the plane. You're out of your mind. Sorry, Carter, but I'm afraid I'll have to put a bullet through the back of your head. Throw it in the way, From his position in the back seat of a three-seated plane, Littlefield presses the revolver against the back of Nick's head and his finger slowly begins to close on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of a man who died twice. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. With Nick at the controls, T.J. Littlefield is in the rear seat of his private plane, a revolver at Nick's head. The plane will fly itself, Carter. Long enough for me to dispose of you two and dump your bodies into that swamp below it. So I'm afraid I'll have to put a bullet through the back of your head. Yes, the plane will fly itself, Littlefield, in the same direction it's headed on you shoot. So let's try a power drive. You, Carter, you fool, pull out of this side. Oh, no. Patsy and I are going to die. We'll all go together. Carter, pull out. We'll crash. Oh, you'll get up my feet, little field. Pull out, quick. First the gun. No. We're almost to the ground. All right. There's the gun. Now pull out. Pull out. Here's my gun. Keep it on me. I'll try, Nick. What's the matter? You have a dream. I have died. Sort of upset me. You'll feel okay in a minute or so. And now, Mr. Littlefield, we'll try a safer landing at the Bay City Airport, where you can tell your story to the sheriff. I think he'll enjoy hearing it. We got a confession all right, Nick. The whole story. If it worked, it would have been a very clever scheme. Not half as clever as the way you figured it out. I only hope it'll help you, Sheriff. Why, hadn't you heard Sam Ritter's given it out all over town that he's not even going to run against me next election. Oh, oh good. Right. Yep. Says if you got to hire a big New York detective to hold the job, he don't want it. Well, that's a break for the taxpayers of this county. From what I've heard, it certainly is. Nick, what's going to happen to Mrs. Buckley? Oh, she'll probably get a jail sentence for attempting to defraud by making that false identification. Yeah, but what about the money? The court will decide what happens to that. Oh, oh by the way, Nick, I made reservations for our trip back to New York. Oh, good. My plane? Uh, no, Mr. Carter. By Pullman. Hmm? Our last plane trip was exciting enough to satisfy me for a long, long time. Oh, sure. Well, Nick, what 
What about next week's case? Bob, it was very exciting. You see, it all... Hmm, excuse me. Hello? Oh, super. Two, eight, four, eight. That is all. Now, see here. I... Hmm. Nick, that wasn't... Yes, Bob, it was that same mysterious woman saying, call super, two, eight, four, eight. Nick, look out the window at that billboard. Well, I'll be done. Call Super 2848. What the dickens is this all about? I don't know, but I'm... Look, Nick, I wish I knew what it means, too, but what about next week's show? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Well, Bob, next week, Patsy and I get mixed up with a bottle of cologne. You mean like perfume? Oh, I'll say. And that bottle of cologne almost made an angel out of me. Those crooks meant business. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Joff McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war, old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Well, Bob, next